uh, policy uh, messages. It's also recognised, particularly in the United States, where um, programs have, were first developed to test out um, a, a program called Housing First. Um, but Housing First is, a, is, is the best way to resolve um, difficult um, uh, situations for people at large risk of homelessness or indeed uh, homeless for a considerable period. Okay, and of course, um, in that context, that is also very strongly a child protection matter, isn't it? Because it is well established that in families where there is male domestic violence, there is probably also violence against children, and there is probably also a high risk of sexual violence against both the woman and, and her children. So that kind of intervention would also save a lot of those children that you talked about who got involved in, in sexual exploitation, having been sexualized at far too young an age. Okay, finally, Ivana, I wonder if you could maybe talk to us about what, what single piece of legislation or a couple of pieces of legislation do you think would make most difference to, to stopping the violence against women and children in Ireland today? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question. I, I wish, so it was just, it's, it's a very tricky question. I mean, I think that there isn't any one piece of legislation or any one magic wand, obviously, as you know, we'd all be aware of that. I think that, um, and I think obviously different strategies need to be used for tackling different aspects of gender-based violence. So, you know, when I was talking earlier, getting on domestic violence, I think, do you think we need to look at the criminal law? I'm quite interested in the idea of a new offence of domestic violence. Up until now, we've been using the general offence, the general law against um, assault, the assault when somebody comes up and hits you on the street. The same sort of criminal law we're using as if your partner in your home is abusing you on an ongoing basis. And the problem with our criminal law is it's very much designed to deal with one-off act, criminal acts by a stranger, you know, and that's the, the basis on which it's built. So it doesn't really deal with ongoing sexual violence or other types of domestic abuse. But I think the one change, you know, would be perhaps to tailor our criminal law so that it's better able to deal, a better focus to dealing with ongoing, recurring violence in, in an intimate setting. I think that would have a, an effect on domestic violence and on um, sexual violence also. In terms of prostitution, the one change in the law, which is complex in an Irish situation because of our law and consent, um, but the one change would be to seek to criminalise the purchase of sex, so to adapt the Swedish model. So that's something we're looking at currently. But those are two big, two big law changes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I'd like to open it up to the, the floor now. So if people have a question or a comment, um, it probably would be helpful for everybody else if you identified yourself and also maybe say where, where you've come from so that people um, get a sense of the, the background from which you're speaking. The, this woman here first. Suzanne Miller, AWC Brussels. Uh, you spoke of the belief of consent as a defense mechanism or method. Does the consent law laws apply to underage sex or to individuals who've been trafficked? Can they apply it to those cases as well? Yeah, yes, I mean, just very simply, we had a, a decision of our Supreme Court in 2006, which, like the US Supreme Court, has power to rule legislation unconstitutional. So we model our Supreme Court, in fact, on the US Supreme Court and powers, the legal powers there. And our Supreme Court ruled in 2006 that you couldn't have a strict liability offence of sex with a minor, in other words, with a child. Up until 2006, it was a criminal offence for a man, or for an adult, to have sex with a child under, a girl under 17. Uh, and that, uh, and it didn't matter whether she was consenting or not, it didn't matter whether he knew she was underage or not. The, the Supreme Court said that there has to be knowledge on the part of the perpetrator as to the age. So that changed our law um, on underage sex up until then, and that has really had a, a knock-on effect on other aspects of our law. So for example, in the Trafficking Act, it's an offence to have uh, to solicit a person for prostitution if they've been trafficked, but you must do it knowingly. So again, the defence who didn't know they were trafficked. Um, so, so the law and consent in Ireland is quite is made more complex and, um, by the Supreme Court judgment in 06 in the case called the CC case, then you're interested in CC against Ireland, and it's had quite a lot of international interest too. Thanks. Uh, there's another woman down at the very back there, and then we'll come up to the front here. If you have a particular person that you're addressing your question to, you might say. Elizabeth Abbott, I'm from the Club in Rome, Italy. Um, to turn the question around about 180 degrees, what is being done to address the true root of the problem, which is educating and or re-educating 
men to deal with their with life up and down without resorting to violence against those that are within their intimate yeah. domestic domain or within their intimate circle. Okay, fine. Um, Ellen, do you want to take that question? Well, um, I guess the really important thing is that we have to start with early intervention prevention. And uh, in the school's education program, there has been a age-related uh, sex education program and relationship program for both primary schools and secondary schools. But unfortunately, um, up to, uh, I think it was about 18 months ago, there was a piece of research done on how that was being delivered in schools, and it mustn't be delivered, actually, uh, by quite a number of schools, which is very worrying. Um, and uh, our own education and training department has developed what's called a body right program to, um, uh, to run alongside the uh, sexual and relationship program in schools. But uh, people didn't feel confident, the teachers themselves didn't feel confident. So we're trying to work with the Department of Education to, to change this. Uh, and I think until we have proper um, early intervention and prevention programs, this is not going to go away. Thanks. Sorry, yeah. can I just add about that? Because I think it's important. Um, I think it's the, ed the education and preventative work is really, really important, and there's not enough of it done, certainly in Ireland. But I mean, we're talking about very complex problems, and I don't think education is the, is the solution on its own. And I always think that the analogy between the work that's been done in violence against women and road safety is interesting because. There was a huge education campaign within Ireland to educate people so that they would reduce their speed, drive within the speed limit in order to, to ensure the safety of other people. And that had very little effect. So I think when you're looking at a problem as complex as violence against women, you have to have a range of measures that work. And where behaviour actually starts to change is where there was a penalty for those who are abusing that. And so I think you need to be careful about understanding the value of the education and the prevention, the work that needs to be done, but not resting your, your hopes for the future completely on that. Thanks, Robert. The woman just on the very front row here, on the right. My name is Katerina. Um, I'm going to be better away from the mic, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Katerina from Kirsten, uh, Oxford, Germany. Um, so I, I would like to um, continue what you said um, because I think um, you talked about there is lots of silence and lots of uh, shame uh, when somebody is committed either as a child or as a uh, grown up. And um, I see um, a big problem when somebody decides to do something against it and to, to prosecute this person. And then um, they manage to go to court and nobody believes this person or to, um, you have to to prove uh, that you have been raped or that violence has been done against you and so it's uh, maybe disappointing or demotivating for others to go to public and to prosecute, to try to prosecute and um, this could also be a sign to not only have to educate men or uh, abusers but you have also to see the consequences if you really do something like that and you'll be punished for it because if you rest uh, like you have no proof then uh, you can just continue and um, you'll be a hero <laughs> at the end because uh, the poor woman uh, loses her place in front of society so it could even be worse for the woman to prosecute and then to uh, stay still and uh, don't say anything and this is the wrong message. Um, I think that's true and that has happened and in fact we had a case here in Ireland about three years ago where a, um, a man was found guilty of sexual assault uh, in Kerry and as he was waiting for sentence uh, 50 people from the community came up and publicly shook his hand, a uh, demonstration of support for him. I mean, that, and that uh, like indicates and, you know, supports your argument. <coughs> However, there was such an outcry in the country, and it was uh, all over the media, and... The